Welcome to Innovation and Leadership. I'm Jess Larson. On this episode, I'm very excited to have multi-billionaire investor, author, businessman, philosopher, Jim Mellon. Jim, thanks for doing this. Oh, thanks, Jess. It's really nice to meet you. I'm very pleased to be on. Well, uh, I need to start with a shout out to our mutual friend, Greg Bailey, for putting us together. Um, but uh, why don't I start with some of what I know about uh, about your career path and, and life, and then have you fill in the blanks that I miss. Is that okay? Perfect. So um, grew up in the UK, which my family uh, is very much from. I grew up in Western Canada, but uh, my grandpa still has cousins in the UK and stuff like this, and so back and forth. But uh, grew up in the UK. Father is a diplomat. Um, when you uh, graduated, uh, you know, gone to Oxford, and when you graduated, you had the Explorer bug, so you went to Hong Kong to work for GT, now LGT. And uh, over the years, they ended up sending you over to San Francisco, and you got to witness the rise of Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and founders of Compaq and uh, uh, those computer companies. Um, ended up starting your own company, and was it called Thornton? I didn't quite figure out that your your investment business is that Thornton. No, that was my that was the T of GT. Uh, he was kicked out of GT, and oh. I went. I worked with him, but I owned 10% of Thornton. And that, when that was sold four years later, I had enough money to start my own company, which was called Regent. Regent. And did you start that in 91? Uh, no, I think, well, yeah, maybe 92. Yeah. Okay. And uh, emerging manager, I mean, going everywhere in the emerging markets, all the way from Russia to China, and uh, saw massive rises there. Um, these days, much more focused on biotech and clean food and property. Um, also, uh, your family office, uh, Burn, Burnbray Group, banking, mining, hotels, substantial landholder in Germany, um, diverse range of projects, um, that you're chairman and co-founder of Juvenescence, not an executive director of Condor Gold, Portage Biotech, Brada, Head Limited, Chelsea, Avondale Limited, Agronomics Limited, executive chairman of Max Financial Group, owner of Consister Bank, um, Established the Mellon Longevity Fund, uh, the Mellon Longevity Center at Oxford. Also an honorary fellow at Oriel College. Am I saying that last one correctly? You are perfect. Um, run forty three marathons, but these days saving joints and and more focuses on getting your fifteen thousand steps a day. Um, spend a lot of time on Isle of Man and in Ibiza. And uh, what what are some of the highlights I missed there, along with the other I, five books and the new I, the, the new I don't know. book coming out. Uh, you've actually summarized me perfectly. I don't have nothing more to say, really, to be quite honest, Jess. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I've kind of, uh, because I, I want to tell you a story, right? So when I was sent to San Francisco, I was 21 or 22 years old. And, I mean, what an exciting place that was. Um, where are you based, by the way, Jess? Uh, I'm outside of Park City, Utah. Okay, right. You know, San Francisco's gone up and recently gone down and maybe up again, hopefully. But um, when when I went there, it was the real early days of the tech boom. And, uh, of course, I didn't know it, and I knew nothing about technology. So I went off to this conference in Palm Springs in California. I'll never forget it. And I'm on this uh, plane, which was PSA. You're probably too young to remember what PSA was, but it was called Pacific Southwest Airlines. And they flew little British-made jets, and they were quite a big airline. Anyway, go to Palm Springs at the conference. There's Bill Gates, Gates, yabbering on. He's only a few years older than me, and then uh, Steve Jobs as well, yabbering on. And I'm sitting there, somewhat, I mean, you know, skeptical and somewhat jealous, to be quite honest, because you know, why do they have all that money and I have none? Anyway. Um, get on the aeroplane on the way back to San Francisco, and who are the two people sitting in front of me but Bill Gates and Steve Jobs? And it was a rarity that they were together because, as you know, there was a lot of animus between them. My life could have been changed if I'd had enough guts to go up, or just right in front of me to say, hey, guys, you know, you were, you were great at the conference. Can you tell me a bit more about what you're up to? But I didn't have the guts to do it. And today, um, I'm probably going to come across as a weirdo, but today I will have no hesitation in talking to anyone because you never know how your life might change if you do that. So the point I'm making is I've kind of had to, because I'm not Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or uh, anyone like that, I've had to navigate uh, through 
waters in my life, which means constant change. And actually, I think constant change is the way that everyone's going to have to navigate from now on, because there is no security. There's no, you know, career that you can do 50 years. Everything is changing. And this is the message that needs to be conveyed to everyone who's young. You will not be in the same job in 20, 30 years time. Don't think about it. It's not going to happen. You know, I'd actually love to hear a little more about that experience. You know, I grew up uh, mostly in a little uh, farming community in Western Canada. And uh, I, I moved to Southern California in my early 20s and got into investment banking on a mergers and acquisitions team at City. And uh, California was amazing to me. What, what was it like to you? Or, or did you kind of know what you were in for? No, I didn't know what I was in for. And I thought it was just fantastic. It's one of the best periods of my life. And then, um, so I went back to Hong Kong, where I'd started, and I was in Hong Kong for another 12 years. And a friend of mine uh, left GT and uh, went off and started his own company, which is called Matthews International. It's a big manager for Americans, particularly retail investors, to invest in Asia. And uh, so, you know, after the years went by and I, I thought, well, I'll go and reconnect with Paul Matthews. So I went to San Francisco, saw him and his wife, and uh, I thought, I'll buy a flat here. So I bought an apartment in San Francisco. And just before the pandemic, I went back and, you know, it was just a shocking place. And I'm sure you've been there with all the grime and crime and just the destitution and hopelessness and despair. And I thought, I'm going to sell. So I sold. And then I bought a place in Florida just before the pandemic. So this was a very good move on my, my part. It's total luck. But uh, now um, on Monday, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to Florida to a conference and then go and visit uh, this apartment that I bought in Florida. Um, and, uh, you know, San Francisco, it's great for technology, et cetera, et cetera. But it's not a great city to live in, in my opinion. No. Yeah. Um, Shame. And, and what, what's the name of the longevity conference you're speaking at? It's not the longevity conference. It's called iConnections. It's the biggest alternative asset conference in the world. Oh, okay. Uh, there's about a thousand LPs who turn up there. It's highly curated. But they've asked me to speak with Alan Patrickoff, who I'm sure you know, who's uh, just recently got married for the third time at the age of 90 in New York, which is very impressive. And um, so he and I are on a panel talking about longevity him from okay. a personal experience and me from more the scientific background sort of stuff yeah oh, it's so exciting well yeah you know today we want to talk about longevity we want to talk about food we want to talk about quantum we talk about fusion and anything else you want but let's start with longevity um you know i uh so i bought your book juvenescence and i got started and i was surprised to see you forward by our friend greg bailey and um, yeah you know you guys have had such great successes i think i was just going through some of the numbers that that he talks about in the forward of, you know, at Medivation, I mean, getting involved, starting at a $12 million pre-money valuation and selling it for 14.3 bill, 14 billion to Pfizer. And then Biohaven, you know, starting out three and a half million raise and then 200 million and then selling that, I believe, for 11 billion to Pfizer. Is that right? Uh, well, Biohaven's still going on, and Greg's still on the board oh. of it. So it's it's uh, it did sell the asset, which was the migraine drug to, or migraine as you call it in America, to Pfizer. But the rest of it's still going, and it's worth $4 billion on the New York Stock Exchange. So uh, it's been a remarkable success. But we mustn't forget that we have a third partner called Deck Dugan, who is a remarkable drug developer. And he uh, has been the glue that's bound the three of us together, really. And um, he's an understated Scotsman. Um, so uh, you beat me to yeah. it because Greg has had such nice things about to say about him, but I haven't met him yet. Um, I, I'm interested in how how the two of you got to work with him and, and why he is uh, so special to the two of you. Well, I think this is, honestly, this is sheer luck. Greg and I met through a mutual friend here in London. And, you know, Greg spends a lot of time in the UK and um and we hit it off we've got very similar aspirations and we are very respectable each other as as investors with different skill sets and um uh we've done so much together in the last 20 years uh and uh you know i'm i'm uh, uh, he is actually the chairman of juvenile essence i'm the deputy chairman and he is full in all committed to the cause of extending 
uh, human life. I'm waiting for the pills to come along in 10 years' time, and I'll be an avid taker of them. But I'm not going to go through the calorific restriction and the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, self-flagellation that Greg goes through on a daily basis to enable himself <laughs> to be certain to live longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. You know, when we were at Formula One together and uh, like the, they were like, where's Greg? Oh, all his friends. Knew. Oh, he went home because when he goes on flights, like he does not sacrifice his sleep. He's gone. You know, we're at this, oh, no, he is. We're at this he, like big he, party. There's like Mark, Mark Wahlberg and all this stuff going on and like Greg's gone because he needed he need to get sleep because he takes it seriously. So, well, he does take it very seriously. I think I can't remember how many pills he takes a day, but it's quite a lot. Um, he looks great. Um, he is uh, in very good form at the moment. And uh, he and I talk just about every single day. Um, he, uh, uh, yeah, no, he's a remarkable individual. But, you know, the three of us sort of hit it off. And every week we have a catch up call wherever we are. Um, and talk about the various issues that we have. And it's not all good. I mean, this, uh, you know, we've got some uh, challenges as well. But generally speaking, we're having a blast about this. So, um, uh, you know, Greg has um, uh, his, what's the right way of putting that? His uh, forte is doing those sort of Mark Wahlberg type events where, you know, influencers and people like, well, yourself, who's got a very big voice, are, are around. I am kind of my audience, if you want to put it that way, is in the Middle East and in Asia, where I was for so long, and here in the UK. So we have a different audience, but nonetheless, audiences are very interested. Who doesn't want to live for another 10 years in a healthy condition? I mean, let's face it, you know, this could be a huge market, and I think it will be a, a huge market. And we've hired a really, really good guy to run the company uh, called Richard Marshall, who came from AstraZeneca. And um, it, we've got 20 shots on goal. I'm pretty confident with the record of the team that we'll get at least one of them on goal. And um, as you can see, three and a half million to 12 billion plus four billion and the remaining equity on the New York Stock Exchange. There's a good record to to look at. Um, uh, what I will say is that the idea that Greg and I put in a million dollars each into Biohaven and we end up with uh a third each of Biohaven at $12 billion doesn't happen because bio, uh, biotech eats up so much money. There's so much dilution that you end up with a good pile of money, but it's nothing like what people think it is, basically. <laughs> yeah. So um, <laughs> when, when you think about when you think about the fascination and the acceleration of investment dollars coming to the space, what's a piece of advice you have for, let's say there's uh, you know, sophisticated individual, maybe they, they built and sold a company and their family office is looking, doing some investing and they're fascinated with this space. What's any advice you have for not getting taken by the snake oil salesman, as we call well, it? It's a, it's, a, it's a very, very good question. It's the most important question there. And because you know, the elixir of youth has been peddled for 5,000 plus years, and it's only now that our biological intervention to uh, change or to alter the pathways of aging is possible. And it's at the very early stage. We're in the kind of the internet in 1995 type stage. Um, I can see in 10 years time as Brian Johnson, who's, you know, the famous guy who really does live the sort of aesthetic life in order to live a very long time. says, don't die because in 10 years time, there'll be something out there that will really be of assistance to all of us. But, the roadblocks in this area, first of all, exactly what you just said, Jess, which is that there are plenty of snake oil salesmen out there. There's so many charlatans, so many anti-aging companies that are doing anything but anti-aging. Um, the second is that all good drugs and therapies should go through the FDA licensing procedure. That takes a lot of money and a lot of time and is uncertain as to whether it's going to succeed. And then the third and key thing is that we all live, hopefully, a long life. So there's no pill that I can give you today in a trial and say, well, okay, we'll wait for 40 years and see if it's enabled you to live beyond or 50 years beyond your what you would expect to live. Because um, no company can sustain that sort of uh, longevity in terms of its expenditure. So uh, we need to find near-term commercial applications that measured with biomarkers and with other diagnostics 
might be able to show some anti-aging effect, but has a patient population which is very specific where money can be made. Otherwise, the companies can't be successful. So what I would say is that, first of all, go to companies that have proper FDA trials, decent managements with decent track records and not spending money on, you know, ridiculous things like going doing conferences in Costa Rica to talk about stem cells or extending telomeres or anything like that. Everything is absolutely approved and going through the due process of the American uh, licensing system, which is by far the best in, and the most the gold plated one in the world. Um, uh, what else can I say? Uh, try and find a company that's got a commercial application that's beyond anti-aging, that looks like it might have a chance of success, uh, that there's not a lot of alternative competition. They have something novel. They have robust IP with long duration um, and that they have reasonable finances. And then, you know, put your money into that. But don't put too much money into that because this is one of those moonshot investments is what I would call a mon money fountain if it works out. But you, if you put a million dollars in, you might get a billion dollars back. I mean, fancifully, maybe a hundred million dollars back, but you don't need to put $10 million in. This is what I'm saying. The, the, the scale relative to your wealth should be relatively modest. Yeah. You know, uh, so I met Brian Johnson on Tuesday and he uh, agreed Great to come guy. on the podcast. <laughs> Greg, Greg and I are going to co-host an episode and, he uh he's an intense guy and i'm you know and i don't know that I, I don't know where i sit on on all the things he's doing but it's fascinating that he's pushing so hard yeah well i interviewed him we have a charitable thing called the longevity forum and uh, andrew scott who wrote 100 year life uh Dathina gracchi who's my other half and uh, myself co-founded this thing and every year in london again please come to it uh we all convene and for a whole week there are events around longevity and i interviewed brian for that and in fact, I'll send you the YouTube uh, so you can sort of, you know, see, yeah, uh, you know, to see what what he's like. He is. Uh, I I at the beginning I thought, okay, this guy's kind of like wacky because you know he's transfusing his son's blood into himself and his own blood into his father, and you know he doesn't do anything that you and I might consider to be fun. Uh, yeah, to talk about going to bed, he, you know, it's like he goes at a very specific time. There's no phone in his room. There's no TV in his room. There's nothing. I mean, basically everything is an easy lifestyle. But he is doing it on behalf of us all because he is the guinea pig that we're not prepared to be to show us, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. And I asked him the question, as I'm sure you will as well, is he doing this for money? I mean, he's got some products like an olive oil product and so forth. And I genuinely don't think he is. I think he is a natural entrepreneur. He's a very good entrepreneur, but he's not doing this for money or attention. I think you'll have a, if it's you and Greg together, I think it'll be a blast. I, think, I, I can't wait to see it, basically. But I'll send you the YouTube later on. Oh, please. And when's the, uh, I totally want to come to that. When's the conference? It's in November. Jess, you're on the list now. So I'll, I'll make sure that uh, Laura sends you all the details on that. Oh, thank you. I'd love to come. Um, speaking of another thing I want to come to, uh, let's take a total tangent and then we'll come back to this. Uh, talk about the TT on the Isle of Man. Okay. All right. So I, this is totally anti-longevity because on average, seven people die a year at the TT race. It is the oh, biggest boy, motorbike much. race in the world. 50,000. I live in the Isle of Man, just to put it in perspective. The Isle of Man is a, a, a sort of rock in the Irish Sea. It's about 220 square miles. Uh, it's very pretty, very beautiful. And um, uh, since 1905, there's been this race. And uh, the reason there's this race in the Isle of Man is because there's speed limits in the UK. And on some roads in the Isle of Man, there are no speed limits. And so these daredevil motorbike mikes uh, go around and it's an organized race. And there's a kind of free for all race that we get 50,000 motorcycles coming over in June uh, uh, to, to race in this race. And uh, it is so scary. I mean, I know you were saying that you went to Formula One with Greg, um, but uh, this is, I mean, Formula One is sort of antiseptic compared to this. This is unbelievable. And uh, the worst ones are the, uh, the the tandem bikes, you know, the ones where they have sidecars, uh, which they don't really have. They're not sidecars. There's someone standing on the back of a tiny little platform uh, at the back of the motorbike and they Honestly, you have to see it to believe it. So come 
and um, we, you'll have a great time. It's fairly, it's not like a glitzy sort of thing, you know, um, there's not uh, a lot of Hollywood glamour there, but it is a remarkable event. It's really, really, really worth visiting. So, and, and I'm totally going to be back to those subjects, but how did you go from uh, living on a rock near Ireland to also spending time in Aviva? Oh, well, I pre uh, uh, about the same time I bought a house in Ibiza and I, I bought a place in the Isle of Man. And uh, Ibiza, I actually don't know why I bought in Ibiza because I'm not really, I don't like going to nightclubs or going out late at night. And we, Dathina and I, who works for Blackstone, by the way, which is a remarkable lesson in how to run a successful business. Um, we like to go to bed quite early and get I get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock every day. And uh, so... Um, uh, Ibiza just seems completely antithetical, but you know, you get a place and I'm sure you, it's the same with you, Jess, and you think, oh, I can't be bothered to move or, you know, I've got my friends around or what. And in our case, we have seven dogs in Ibiza and uh, it's just tough to, 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 to move. But, you know, I do think, um, I know Greg spends a lot of time in Ibiza, by the way, that we're going to be fried to death because climate change is really affecting Spain and the Mediterranean at the moment. I mean, we've not had any rain for nine months in Ibiza, none. And uh, we drilled three wells in the last year to try and get some water on our property. Couldn't get any. And so I have to buy water. And, you know, OK, in the context of someone who's relatively wealthy, it may not sound a lot, but it's a thousand euros, which is about a thousand dollars a week to pay for the water. Now, you're sitting in Utah, you wouldn't pay $50,000 a year for your water, but that's what we're paying, basically. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, so, um, well, I'll probably see you there because Greg invited us to come stay for a week. So hopefully oh, we'll be there at the same time I, as you. I, I, he, he has a different life. You come and visit us, okay? I mean, I'm not saying to stay. You're going to stay with Greg, but come and visit the house because we have a spitfire in the garden. We have a tram from the Isle of Man in the garden. And we have seven dogs. So you and, uh, you know, whoever you're coming with, you'll have a great time visiting us. Yeah. And and by the way, we don't have a curfew like Greg does. So you won't have to go home at 5.30 <laughs> for, for extra sleep. <laughs> Although maybe I need some sleep training. I'm, gonna, I gotta, I gotta, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be more like Greg if I ever grow up, right? Okay. No, no. So um, let's, let's go back. Um, when you think about, I, I want to talk a little bit about this investing in longevity or anti-aging kind, kind of world. Um, one of the things, I, I loved all your advice. And one of the things I want to go a little deeper in is this idea of um, understanding the quality of the management team. Because it's so easy for, for the rest of us civilians to hear like, oh, they got a PhD from this fancy sounding school and they were part of this fancy company that made a lot of money. But it might be harder for, for the rest of us to understand like, what did they really do at that company? And we, you know, like, sure, it all looks good on paper, but, but like, how do we get enough, you know, like, how do we talk to enough folks around them to really understand, like, was this really the person, you know, largely responsible for that success? Or were they just a passenger on the caboose, you know? And so as you think about vetting people whose resume looks absolutely great, who I'm sure you've been disappointed in some of those people in the past, as you think about like, the people that interview well versus the people that perform well, or the people who look good versus the people that are good. Do you have any thoughts on on discerning that? Yeah, I think that um, this is not a skill that I have, all right? So I, I'm not good at interviewing people. I just take a chance on people. And uh, the people I work with, I'm um, talking about in my own family office or in the, the businesses which I have a greater degree of control over, um, We've, we've been working together for a very long time, 30, 20 to 30 years on average, I would say. So, you know, there's no perfection, um, but I think loyalty counts for a lot. And um, uh, so, but I'm just not very good at that triage, which is a very necessary one. But people who, as you rightly point out, Jess, who are great on paper and really impressive when you talk to them um, for the the time that you interview them. But I just don't have the patience to go through the, monumental amounts of uh, interviewing that someone like Goldman Sachs or Blackstone does. But there is a trick to it. And I, I just want to refer back to what where Dafina works, if I may, for a second, Blackstone. I was thinking about this before I talked to you today, and I really wanted to get this message across. Blackstone is a 150 billion US dollar market capitalization company. And it's the world's largest private equity 
uh, a property uh, owning company in the world. And um, it has 4,000 employees. Okay. Uh, and uh, Goldman Sachs, which is a pretty good company, has 20 times the number of employees uh, and has a lower market capitalization than Blackstone. Uh, Citibank, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, uh, HSBC, our biggest bank here in the UK, which is called Lloyd's, which is a terribly managed institution, but has a very big market share. All of them have tiny market capitalizations compared to Blackstone. There's something about the model where you really get the right people to work for you, something I'm not very good at, but it, the, your question is so apposite. You really take the time to make sure you curate the right people. And then you build an asset-like business that um, uh, is just so focused, so relentless, so on message, so uh, like, keen on the numbers, I mean, keen on the numbers in terms of just getting them absolutely right, that you end up with a company with $150 billion uh, market capitalization and a trillion dollars uh, under management. And so Blackstone, to me, and I watched Dafina with all, I mean, I don't know anything about the detail of the company, but I do know that this is a brilliant organization. And there are some things that uh, I'm trying to learn for myself uh, that Blackstone practices that other companies just don't have. And one of them is that they hire very, very, very carefully along the lines of what you were just talking about so presciently. I think that, um, you know, you're absolutely right. And uh, so I, I think neither Greg or I, uh, to be quite honest, have the patience to sit through 17 rounds of interviews with people. So we make judgments and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. And so, as I said, there's good and there's bad in the stuff that we do. And it's all down um, to the people. Yeah. Well, maybe I'll go a different direction. Um, there's so many people in business investing that would like to accomplish what you have. And yet, statistically, so very few have. What do you think is different about you? What's, what's maybe one of the core principles that you feel like has served you so well over your career? Well, first of all, I feel inadequate in the, um, the context of some of the people that I see uh, you know, around me. Uh, who've done so much better than I have. and uh, But they have something which I don't have, which is some, some sort of extraordinary um, ability to drive forward a new invention. or an, uh, they, they can see a new market that I can't see. So what I am is a very competent plagiarist and a very good jumper on bandwagons. Uh, and I'm very fast on the bandwagon, by the way. Uh, and then a mobilizer like Greg, together we're brilliant uh, of capital that surrounds those bandwagons that we're we're pushing forward because we don't have enough money to advance all these very expensive projects ourselves so we need other people's money but we are also integrate so we want those people to make money and that's why we invest at every stage with all the other investors on identical terms so that we're not uh, sort of promoters who buy at one cent sell at ten dollars or a hundred dollars or whatever we are genuine investors for the long term and we go up and down with the investors that we bring in. So we regard everything as a partnership, really. Uh, but um, I think both Greg and myself uh, understand and can seize an opportunity. Uh, we also work very hard. You know, there is no easy way to make money. Uh, there's no sort of casino that you just go in and suddenly the money come, comes pouring out. As I said to you, I get up at 4.30 or 5 o'clock every morning. I work until sometime after lunch normally, which is quite a few hours. And then typically I do some work in the afternoon. But, you know, you've got to work and you've got to read a lot. I mean, reading is really key to getting, uh, you know, to know something like, I mean, most people, you say, what's fusion? They wouldn't know the difference between fusion and fission. I mean, that's, that's honestly, almost no one knows that difference. And uh, the only way you're going to get that knowledge is by reading. Uh, the only way, for instance, that, I was lucky enough to know people and to understand the whole uh, rationale for this because I was the co-founder of a uranium company in 2006, uh, which we sold. Um, but I, I knew that last year uranium was absolutely the right thing to invest in. So we, we put a lot of money into uranium and made very, very good money. So it's just about accumulated knowledge, knowing a lot of people, 
making everyone your partner, being decent to people, and then you'll do very, very well. But, you know, uh, doing the, like, if, you know, if I had a son, which I don't, but if I had a son, he came to me and said, oh, Dan, I've got a great idea. I want to start a chain of coffee shops. I'd say, well, you know, what's different about your coffee shop to anyone else's coffee shop? You've got to have a distinguishing proposition. You can't just have, you know, I'm not going to start a dry cleaning uh, chain um, because there's no barrier to entry. Find something that has a moat around it that you genuinely can protect. Um, it is one of the interesting things that's fascinating about the drug development that you've done and the ability to have those rights for 20 years and these kind of things, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I actually admire about both you and Greg is like, when we talk about investing in businesses, which obviously, uh, you know, even with the losses, have net have net done so well for both of you. Greg says things like, well, if you're not, if this isn't a space that's like in your circle of competence, just don't put all your money in it, put 1% of your money in it, try it out. Yeah. Or like, just know when you're saying you were before you were saying like, yeah, yeah, no, don't put all your money in it. Just just try, just try a little. Absolutely. And, you know, so many of the promoters are like, I would get as much of this as you possibly can. Like I just hear the reverse message. Yeah. And uh, I think that says something about your integrity. Well, I, we really, Greg and I don't want, you know, both of us come from, oh, well, yeah, not humble, but, you know, not very wealthy backgrounds. And uh, we don't, you know, we saw our parents and, you know, they had some savings, but not a huge amount of savings. And I just don't want people to lose money because of, I, I can't sleep at night if I think, I mean, we're all going to lose money in something or other. You know, you can't be right all the time, but um, don't try and mislead people. And I know people who mislead people. You know, I, I do know um, uh, promoters who literally steal money out of people's pockets. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, let's switch gears. You are so pas passionate about the future of food. And I... Uh, I don't know. To me, it's it's so interesting. You know, growing up in a farming community from a hundred years of farmers in the background, uh, you know, coming over from coming over from England to be farmers in in uh, Western Alberta in the 1890s and stuff. Okay, and uh, so my dad, even though he was a community development officer for the provincial government, he would come home and put his clothes on and then go out and garden. That's what he did for fun when he got home. Right. And so I got to do more than my fair share of it, <laughs> whether I wanted to or not. Right. And uh, but to me, like from an investor standpoint, like putting in a seed and getting back multiples is actually kind of interesting. Um, but I want to know what you're excited about on, on the future of food. OK, so first thing I'm going to say is that what we're doing in food is multi-generational. It's going to take a very, very long time. Um, and so we're not trying to get rid of conventional farming tomorrow morning. We're not trying to put people out of business tomorrow. But there is a growing demand, particularly for animal proteins around the world and from countries that were formerly poor that are now getting to be middle income like China or India. There isn't enough land. There isn't enough environment to provide that protein for those people. And we know, at least I know, I think you probably agree with me that we are in a climate emergency at the moment. And uh, one of the main contributors to global emissions is conventional intensive farming and particularly the dairy industry and particularly the beef industry. Those are the ones that create the greatest amount of methane on the planet. And methane is 100 times more poisonous than carbon dioxide. So what we're trying to do is to find alternatives to some aspects of farming, which can be made in laboratory conditions with much lower environmental impact, uh, much less land to use, much more food security, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll just give you a couple of examples. I mentioned dairy. There are about 250 million dairy cows around the world. I don't know if you were involved in dairy or not, but uh, dairy is a very... Uh, difficult business because the margins are very thin. Um, you know, there's a lot of contamination, a lot of issues with the cows, et cetera, et cetera. And as you probably know, a dairy cow will live for about four years, whereas if it was out in the field, it would live for 25 years uh, because the 
it's got to be pregnant all the time and if others get so big that it breaks the back of the cow it's a pretty awful situation actually um and uh so and in some places dairy production is completely inefficient so in saudi arabia for instance where it's just hot the desert they import the cows they put them into air conditioned sheds burning fossil fuels in order to provide the electricity to uh to air condition the cows and they grow alfalfa to feed the cows uh, using desalinated water again highly energy intensive it's completely nuts frankly so what is being done now and it's being done and on sale in the united states is to produce the exact equivalents of uh the key components of cow's milk this is not almond milk or soy milk or anything like this, this is what's bioidentical milk using what's called precision fermentation and this is very exciting because you can put plants in places where it doesn't make sense to have dairy production you can reduce the methane emissions you can reduce the environmental impact and from my point of view being very animal loving uh reduce the cruelty to animals although most consumers don't care about that they really don't have a, a clue about the way in which animals are treated out of sight out of mind as far as they're concerned um and we're building our first factory at the moment in the United States will be up and running by the end of this year the production has been pre-sold for at least 5 years the returns are fantastic we're investing about 150 million dollars in it uh and uh the company was one that we started it's called Liberation Labs and it's owned by our investment vehicles that invest in this area it's really exciting another area is eggs you probably know that hens are kept in pretty appalling conditions uh the average chicken lives for 26 days before it's slaughtered but if you're a egg laying chicken um you know you have a longer lifespan but it's a pretty miserable life and um so but 60% of eggs are used in baking confectionery etc and they're not shelled that you know, no one sees the shell you don't need the shell so we can produce the exact equivalent of uh egg albumin uh and again uh that will be on the market in the well the dairy stuff is on the market already in the United States but the albumin will be on the market within a couple of years it's going to disrupt the whole of the egg producing industries and then behind that this is all called precision fermentation it's like a brewing process but behind that is the so called cell agriculture where you take a stem cell very small sample from one living animal doesn't get slaughtered and from that you can create any amount of food but from an arable production point of view from a fruit and vegetable point of view from a sheep point of view from uh the point of view of flowers or in like that it doesn't make sense to do this this is only viable for dairy egg and for uh meat and fish production and our first fish will be on the market in the United States by well the end of this year or the beginning of next year which will be tuna fish produced in a lab so it's it's a disruptive for, disruptive force but only in certain areas um it's multi-generational and its impact it's going to take a long long time for it to have an impact so don't worry if you're an existing farmer but it is there and it is really exciting to me because it could make an immediate impact on the environment and particularly on the cruelty to animals we didn't have intensive farming before the second world war now 99% of farming in the united states for the animals is intensive and just to let you know Jess, the average american eats 7000 formerly live animals in his or her lifetime all right 7000 um and the average american lives 6 years less than the average european telling you something about how food and human health are connected wow wow I feel like we could do a whole episode on that but i want to i want to talk still about uh, quantum infusion with our last couple right. minutes why don't why don't you give me a couple minutes on each you're, right, you're well, too interesting we can't fit you all in an hour oh well, thank you jess that's very kind of you um so uh well quantum computing is uh it's going to displace a lot of conventional computing it's an but sort of it's always been a, an area of great promise but now it's being translated into commercial success and the company that i'm an investor in um is uh now done a merger with uh not a merger a full merger but a merger with Honeywell's quantum uh, division which is a very leading so the United States and the UK are the world leaders in this area way ahead of China 
uh, which you'll be pleased to know about. And um, uh, th this company has just recently, in the last week, has raised $300 million at a $5 billion pre-money valuation. So it's real. There's real excitement in, among investors for this area. Uh, the first thing that will disrupt is the uh, passwords <laughs> on the Internet. <laughs> cryptography will be completely changed. And the second thing is that Bitcoin will be completely changed by quantum because the whole of the uh, blockchain is based on conventional computing, not quantum. So you've got to watch this space. Um, I would write a book about it if I had the capability or the patience to write a book about it, but I'm actually writing a book about fusion, which is the other place, the, the other thing you uh, asked me about. And again, the United States and the UK are the world leaders in this area. And from my old university, Oxford, uh, is the kind of leader in this country um, around fusion. So basically, fusion is literally that. It's fusing atoms to create energy equivalent to the sun's energy. Um, and without radioactive material, or very little radi radioactive material compared to conventional nuclear fission, um, without the need for uranium and all that sort of stuff. Um, and... The United States, Lawrence Livermore Labs, they've the first place in the world which has got more energy out than energy in. It's a kind of theoretical thing at the moment. But in the next 10 years, there's a possibility that you'll have on-grid production of uh, fusion um, electricity. And if that happens, then countries which are formerly highly dependent on imports of fossil fuels uh, may find that the geopolitics change for them completely. And so it's really important that the U.S. and the U.K. collaborate on this and that we don't allow bad actors to get hold of this technology through theft or through, um, you know, IP pillage uh, and that we make this our own project. Because uh, the U.K. and the U.S. or the U.S. in particular were the ones to develop the atomic bomb from which came nuclear, conventional nuclear energy. And this country, the UK, was the first one to have a uh, conventional nuclear plant after the Second World War. Um, but we, both the US and the UK, uh, lost their advantage over time. We cannot afford to do that with fusion. This is too important, too strategically important. So, you know, listeners, please talk to your congressman, congresswoman, and back the US-UK uh, ventures in fusion. It's really important for us. Could be world transforming. Anyway, I'm writing a book on it. So there we are. No, ah, I love it. We we could again do a whole nother interview on that one. I can I can tell there's enough there to talk about. Um, Jim, this has been so fun for me. Thank you for making the time to do this. Uh, I've really enjoyed it, Jess. I can't wait to see you in Ibiza. And uh, as I said, uh, come over. Um, and I know Greg will be there. And you'll be staying with him, and you'll see uh, the Spitfire, and we'll have a drink on my tram in the garden. <laughs> so great. Thanks everyone for listening.